Let's go do it. Uh, Mayor Rogers, Councilmember Fleming, and Chair Rogers. Here. Let the record reflect that all um, subcommittee members are present with the exception of Mayor Rogers. All right, thank you so much. Uh, before we jump into it, uh, we have no remote participation today. Uh, for minutes, we have the April 3rd, 2024 regular meeting minutes. Let's see if there's anybody from the public who has an amendment to those minutes or any questions about them. We have a copy of the minutes printed. We don't have a copy. Of yeah, minutes. we just have the agenda. Oh, that'll teach me. And in mind, I guess I can't say nothing about it. No. I'll tell you what, Dwayne, if you, if you find something, go ahead and let us know, and we can uh, put on a future agenda for discussion. Does that work for you? All right, then we'll show those adopted as presented. Let's go to public comment for non-agenda items. Yes. Go ahead, Dwayne. Uh, I should come over here. Or... Oh, you're good there. All right. Hello, my name is Dwayne DeWitt. I'm from Roseland. Most of you probably know that California has been fighting air pollution for over 60 years. That came about due to the smog that was down in Los Angeles. And it's been an issue that's never really been fully resolved. So I've been a respiratory therapist for 50 years. And one of the things that we always have to deal with is children who have been negatively affected by small particulate matter, uh, basically from trucks, diesel trucks, all kinds of stuff, and from fires. So children, we say to ourselves always, oh, we're going to make sure and make decisions that are helpful to the next generation. But we haven't necessarily been doing that. I hope you folks know about the American Lung Association. They just released a report called State of the Air, pointed out that 131 million Americans are breathing unhealthy air, putting them at risk for lung diseases such as asthma and cancer. Basically, they also pointed out that exposure to even low levels of fine particulates can be deadly. Unhealthy levels of ozone air and pollution continue to make breathing difficult for more Americans across the country than any other single pollutant they went on to state. The reason I bring this up is because we've been cutting down trees here in Santa Rosa a lot. I don't know if you go over to Fifth Street, but we lost some trees there. We have a nice little urban heat island now because we lost all the trees along Fifth Street and then some redwoods along, I believe that's D or E, excuse me, maybe it's uh, even more. Anyway, the long story is killing trees to save concrete is not the best way to go about what you folks talk about for climate adaptation, for moving forward on any climate types of issues. And then also saving what you do have in terms of an urban forest is very important. We have very few urban forests in close to the downtown area, and we should save all of that that we can. Most of the uh, natural areas that we have are way out on the east side of town, out by Annandale, as it's called. And basically, anyone from the west side has to go out that way if they want to get some true natural areas. I would advocate that you folks follow a path of what would that little child like to have in 20, 25 years, and their children that come after that you perhaps being a grandfather going like, okay, I did it right. Thank you, kind. Thank you, Dwayne. Uh, and I will just let you know uh, so that you can be here in October. We have agendized a discussion in this committee about trees, specifically tree policies, all of that sort of thing. It's really simple. Trees, leave. Yep. Go ahead, Beth. Uh, Beth Brown. I'm a founding mem member of a new organization called Santa Rosa Relief. Oh. It's under the umbrella of California Relief, which is a network of uh, groups in the state of California, Petaluma being one of our partners. And I just did a tour with Paul Miller, an attorney uh, downtown uh, with Petaluma Relief and their parks department. I can tell you Santa Rosa is in the dark ages. Petaluma, a fraction of our size, armed with a million dollars in Inflation Reduction Act money, started years before that though, are planting trees everywhere. And they're planting big native trees everywhere. They are working in collaboration with the park department. They share uh, space, they share ideology, the leadership is on board. And we did 
they drove around and looked at five or six different sites of planting. On this agenda, every time you guys meet should be tree canopy, tree canopy in equity. There should be tree policies that cities have been implementing for decades. I can tell you, I've lived in Santa Rosa, I've, or San Francisco, Walnut Creek, Oakland. You guys don't have any of these policies. If you do, you don't enforce them. My neighbor at 736 Pine Street, Lock, Pine, Pine Street locked down two 20 year old crepe myrtles. Was there a consequence to that? None. So you guys, your city locked down 12 on 5th and D Street and then some redwoods. Is there a replacement plan for that? There isn't. So this is, I, I've been here before. I'm going to say it again. Every time I show up, I would assume that tree canopy from uh, equity to your tree score to canopy to policies would be on here. And it's not. Every time I come here, it's not. And it's a simple, simple thing we can do. Trees cost 75 bucks. Everyone in this room could participate in digging a hole and getting a tree in. And that is gonna solve not every problem, but it's gonna solve some problems. Air quality, heat index, health outcomes, a whole bunch of stuff. And I speak from someone who worked at the University of California, San Francisco in public health and health research, I'm not a crazy tree hugger, but it is a simple thing we can do to uh, solve or at least meet um, some major problems that we are facing. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Ben. Anybody else for public comment? Yeah. Go ahead, sir. Yeah, Michael Kells. And um, I just want to say that I appreciate you folks speaking on the climate subcommittee because you're kind of holding it together. There have been a lot of cancellations, not, not much to put on the agenda or talk about. But I moved to San Jose five years ago after selling my biodynamic farm. Recently retired as a functional medicine environmental doc. And I have a couple issues that I want to talk about that I think are important for the city, not only to meet its climate goals and the fact that it's signed on the CER, but also to look at our children and our grandchildren and generations to come in terms of what we're doing with our spaces. And it's already been elucidated that we need more green trees et cetera, et cetera. I think to communicate and educate department heads and their staff about the importance of greening or creating urban forests is really important. Because if we isolate, trees are super important. If we isolate on them, people can easily discard that because they're around us all the time. People see them, et cetera. So again, I want to applaud you for being here. It's hard to listen to always negative complaints, but I want to open the discussion so that we see the positive side of it, of what potential solutions are. They've already been elucidated by Beth and uh, Dwayne. But every morning I walk my dog downtown uh, from Monroe Street, and we walk around along Fifth Street. And three weeks ago, we were walking by there, and by the time we get there, it's pretty hot. So my dog's running for shade and there was no shade there. And I recognized that all those mature mimosa trees were taken down. So immediately my thought is, man, I'm angry about this. So I talked to a worker with a backhoe and he said that they were diseased. I asked him why he didn't know. Uh, do you plan, plan to replant? No, not that he knows of because if they replant, it's going to disturb the asphalt. Well, there are simple ways to mitigate that. For survival of trees when we plant them, we need to create an environment in which they can survive. And that means using permeable spaces around trees so they can gain access to water and nutrients. And the damage you see in sidewalks and asphalt is because a tree is searching for water and it's searching for nutrients. So it's going to do whatever it can to get to the surface to obtain them. So I think it takes just a broader look when we design projects, bring different people together 
to look at the big picture and what's going to sustain us. And nature-based solutions are the least expensive ways to mitigate climate change. There's no doubt about it. If you look at Walter Jenny's work from Australia, who as a country are in the forefront of climate change. Michael, I need you to start to wrap up if you can. Okay. Yeah. okay. Uh, so did I just have three minutes? Yeah. Okay. So I'll, I'll conclude by saying that it would have been really helpful if there was transparency for not uh, only adjacent businesses, but for local residents. And that we need to look at how we replant. We need to do it sooner than later because every day without a tree reduces our resiliency capital uh, for reducing climate change. So I'll kind of leave it at that. Okay. And then, uh, you know. Thank you, Michael. And we will have, a, like I said, an opportunity in October. We'll do a full discussion about trees. And uh, so I look forward to your participation. Anybody else for public comment? One more thing. I just want to point people we, to the Press Democrat to look at the article about Petaluma Relief. It's great. just recent. Cool. Thank you. All right. I'll bring it back to staff then. Let's go to our department reports. Uh, thank you, uh, Councilman Rogers. Uh, I have no uh, department reports today. Okay. Uh, let's go on to our 6.1 then, the update on artificial turf restriction investigation. Well, I'm going to this up here. So uh, good afternoon, uh, Councilor Rogers, Councilor Fleming. Uh, my name is Peter Martin. I'm the Deputy Director of Water Resources for the Water Department. Uh, with me at the table today is Scott Wilkson, who is a Parks Planner uh, for the Parks Park or Parks Division of the Rec and Parks Department, as well as uh, Jimmy Bliss, the Chief Building Official for from the Planning and Economic Development Department. Um, I do have also several. Uh, department heads uh, in the audience. This has been a group effort to get this presentation before you today, uh, and they may be able to answer any questions uh, to which we can't. Uh, so, um, with that, I'll, I'll just jump right into the presentation uh, just to orient you to how we got here today. So uh, within the council's work plan, uh, it directed staff to investigate the feasibility of additional citywide restrictions on artificial turf installations. So. Uh, hence why we are here today. Um, we last came to this uh, subcommittee of the council back in October, 2023. Uh, staff did provide an overview of synthetic turf, uh, the regulatory environment around it and other local considerations. Um, at that uh, subcommittee, the climate action subcommittee uh, did provide direction to staff and also requested quite a bit more information uh, for staff to come back with. So uh, hence we're here today. Um, and seeking uh, recommendations and direction from this uh, subcommittee on how to go forward. I do want to note, uh, since that uh, staff have met internally several times, uh, different departments obviously have a lot of input into this uh, evaluation. And I, I just uh, do want to acknowledge uh, my colleague, Claire Nordley. Uh, she's out on maternity leave right now, but she was a big part of uh, pulling this all together. So we'll try to cover several areas uh, in this presentation agenda uh, for which the subcommittee did provide uh, additional feedback and requests more information. Uh, those are areas around regulations, enforcement, and funding, uh, as well as some questions about environmental effects um, and impacts to city-owned parks as well. Uh, also, uh, we'll talk a little bit about other jurisdictions' actions uh, in relation to artificial turf restrictions. And then we'll wrap it up and see direction and next steps uh, from the subject. So um, I'll just start uh, with the first part of this presentation um, and talk a little bit about some of the state regulation um, around uh, restrictions for artificial turf. Um, in 2015, coming out of the prior drought to the last drought, um, the uh, legislature did enact uh, a prohibition on local jurisdictions making any uh, regulations prohibiting the installation of drought tolerant landscaping. In that they caught up artificial turf as well. So that was to prevent uh, HOAs and others from uh, 
basically allowing folks to convert turf at their, at their residences. Um, just last year, uh, they did a, a somewhat surgical uh, removal of that blanket prohibition um, for artificial turf installations on residential properties. So opening the door uh, for local jurisdictions to enact their own uh, restrictions. On private property? On residential property, correct. Um, and then uh, just tracking some legislation from last year, uh, the city did support two bills uh, that would have uh, put more strong, stronger prohibitions on uh, PFAS, including uh, prohibiting public entities um, from pursuing the installation of artificial turf, um, and also would have put more blanket prohibitions on uh, different chemicals, uh, excuse me, uh, different uh, distribution of products with PFOS in them. Uh, those two bills were uh, ultimately vetoed by the governor. Um, and really it was around the fact that um, the governor did not support a single product chemical ban as those have been proven to be hard to implement uh, in the past. Uh, he also provided direction that they should be utilizing the regulatory agencies to enact uh, some of the prohibitions. Uh, including uh, the Department of Toxic Substances Control. I did want to highlight that just starting uh, this last month, uh, the Department of Toxic Substances Control did uh, initiate a rulemaking investigation. It's part of a three-year work plan. Uh, partially was directed by the governor during those times when he vetoed that legislation. Um, he asked them to investigate uh, this particular product combo um, including uh, artificial turf. So they released a report and began that sort of fact-finding element of their potential rulemaking in the future. Um, there are what they call candidate chemicals present in artificial turf. Um, and uh, candidate chemicals are chemicals that potentially have the potential to harm people or the environment. Um, and they're also formally listed in the California Code of Regulations through a rulemaking. So. Um, in determining how they want to proceed and whether to go forward with a product chemical combination like artificial turf, which they are focused on, um, the agency generally evaluates those products in a specific product category, um, and they are working on this particular product chemical combo. So um, some of those additives that are already in the list are include PFOS and orthophthalates, uh, among us or other chemicals as well. Um, as you can see from that, figure there, uh, there are a different construction perhaps of different types of artificial turf that do have certain elements that have uh, these chemicals present uh, in their manufacturing. Um, I did also want to note uh, that we did dig into the local uh, zoning codes for the city. Um, there was a chapter in zoning code that says artificial ground cover for shrubs shall not be allowed. Uh, initially, there was uh, a possibility staff dug into it and looked to see if that could potentially be used as enforceable for artificial turf. Uh, given that it was passed uh, quite a while ago, uh, it superseded that time when legislation was passed by the state that prohibited cities from <coughs> enacting any type of restriction on artificial turf. Uh, it also, the, the term artificial ground cover is a bit elusive and would be hard uh, to really um, enforce that uh, particular for this particular application. Um, but however, um, I do want to note that, you know, reversing that course from that 2015 legislation, uh, the city can now enact ordinance banning artificial turf beginning January 1st of this year. Um, with that, I'm going to pass uh, it over to, to Jimmy Bliss uh, to talk a little bit about some of the potential enforcement options. Uh, as requested by this uh, subcommittee. Yeah, so basically we have a couple of main methods that we have available to us for enforcement. So we have the reactive or the proactive. Uh, so the reactive would be what we do for most of our code enforcement things. The, uh, we get a complaint that comes in and we start an investigation and go and look into it and see what we can find. Or, or on the proactive side, uh, we can voluntarily go out and say, hey, you've got turf here, we need to uh, take care of that, that type of thing. Um, so the, the problem with reactive is we 
wouldn't have as many violations come through. We haven't had a lot of complaints over the years. So the, the proactive might be more beneficial if we are trying to go forward with, with some gusto on that. Um, but it also requires more staffing time to look things up. You go to the next slide. Um, as part of that staffing resources, we have a couple options there too. If we do end up keeping the same staffing that we have now, it takes away from other priorities. We have PD, we have vacant buildings, we have life safety stuff. Um, those are the types of things that we would be shifting from to take care of the turf. Um, alternatively, we could have um, the option of another code enforcement officer that's dedicated to that and they can spend time researching. They get pretty good at it. Um, have that available as well. Um, part of the larger problem there for us would be that there isn't a permit required for installation of turf. So enforcing it ahead of time would be a much more difficult. Like if we saw it on the plans for other types of structures that are going in, we could call it out then. But for the most part, people just come in and they would install it without our knowledge. And then we'd have to come back retroactively and say, hey, you got turf here and they have this jurisdictional law that uh, doesn't allow it. So it would be pretty tough for us to go back and do that. Um, it's also hard to, to determine when those are installed. So a lot of people We'd have to go to the aerials basically that we have that are like every two to four years that we take and we'd have to say oh it looks like you have it you installed it about this time between these years and if we have this date that we go forward on um, if we say hey from now on we don't allow turf because it's been illegal to prohibit it previously uh, we have to go back through all our records and research each property and see hey you installed this then you installed this then and without the um, uh, uh, the homeowners actually giving us that information, it's hard for us to verify. Another problem we have there is that we don't have jurisdiction over schools and things um, to be able to ban what they put on their, their properties for the public schools. But the private schools we do, but we only have like one private school in all of the city. So it kind of looks like we're targeting them if we say that you can't have turf or artificial turf on this one, but everyone else can. Those are some of the enforcement challenges that we should. So I'll pick up the presentation again from here. Um, so uh, I'll just, uh, for the next few sections, there was a lot of questions that came from the subcommittee. I'll put up the question and sort of respond to those the best I can from what we've learned through our research as staff. Um, there was a question specifically that asked if there is state or federal funding to convert existing artificial turf installations to natural turf. Uh, we did check in with the Renee Public Policy Group that is our firm that is helping us with grants uh, for the city. Uh, they were not aware of any grant opportunities that support these types of conversions, either large or small. Um, I did want to note too that the city has not ever incentivized the installation of artificial turf in our cash for grass programs. Uh, somewhat incompatible with our, our view on what we'd like to get out of those uh, natural installations. Uh, there also was a question, uh, sorry, uh, just to note, we are moving on to the environmental impact section of this presentation. Uh, there was a question uh, uh, as to whether there are any disposal options available for recycling artificial turf. Uh, we, we did reach out to several uh, areas and jurisdictions around and that there are no local options available for recycling. Um, and really a lot of it has to do with, it requires very specialized uh, facilities to be able to process these types of things. Um, and, you know, of course, there's a wide variety of materials that are utilized in artificial turf uh, installations. And so really um, those efforts have yet to materialize, especially locally or anywhere really in the state. Um, there are some manufacturers that claim to take back uh, artificial turf at the end of its life, um, but it really depends on the condition of that artificial turf as to whether they'll take it. Um, there was a question about uh, greenhouse gas comparisons between uh, artificial turf and uh, natural turf. Uh, there, the literature is does have a wide ranging um, you know, returns on what is uh, really publicly accessible and peer reviewed. Um, but some studies did show that really, it is known that the manufacturing process does inherently require water energy and it is a non-renewable material. 
um, the CO2 emissions in this study uh, really occur during that manufacturing process and the install, of course, uh, as well as you know, some of the elements they looked at were related to the transport and the maintenance and the end of that life uh, for our official turf installations. So um, really the, the CO2 emissions vary widely depending upon uh, the infill materials and the, the manufacturer obviously is broad compared to say a very highly engineered large installation versus just a residential installation. So, um, really though, uh, this one study that we did find found the carbon footprint of a 9,000 square meter artificial turf installation with a 10 year lifetime uh, does have about 55.6 tons of CO2 ultimately estimated to be around three times that of a natural turf installation of that same size. So there are also questions about heat island effects um, from these installations. The uh, University of Massachusetts uh, Toxics Use Reductions Institute, or TURI, has published some uh, research and information on this particular item. Uh, it is known that outdoor synthetic turf reaches higher temperatures than natural grass, regardless of what type of NFL materials are there. Uh, but there have been some advancements, uh, as noted in this study, uh, in heat reflective technologies. And really, uh, they noted that the different infill materials can really change a lot of the heat island effect. Um, and then, uh, you know, just in general, um, there, there are just these, these known challenges with these types of issues on these playing surfaces. Uh, there were some questions uh, from the subcommittee uh, about water quality and human health. Um, one of those questions in particular was, can PFAS and other chemicals leach from artificial turf and enter groundwater waterways? Uh, um, and then there was a question about the health effects uh, for human health uh, interacting with artificial turf, whether it be playing, walking, uh, just generally having contact with these surfaces. Um, and so it, there were no direct toxicity type studies or other things like that that could be um, directly attributable to, to that point source from an artificial turf. We're exposed to chemicals every day. Um, you know, the, these chemicals are known to be present in artificial turf, but it's a little bit more elusive to try to attribute a certain point source of that to uh, a human contact or even a waterway, say in a stormwater setting, uh, except if you were able to measure it directly uh, behind an installation. So, um, but what is known uh, is, is very clear is that PFAS and then other pollutants are known to be present in the manufacture of these materials. So there obviously is a pathway for those things to enter in the environment. Um, and that these chemicals are very much known uh, to be uh, harmful to the environment and humans and they are prevalent in our environment. So, um, and as I noted, the specific impacts to water quality and human toxicity directly attributable to this point source from artificial turf are really hard to define, but um, they are attempting to try to do a better job of these um, you know, combined toxicity testing for human impacts. As well. so, um, there was a question about education and outreach and how we talk to the public about um, artificial turf. Uh, in a variety of different settings, uh, the city of Santa Rosa does promote the Russian River friendly landscaping approach and artificial turf is not consistent with those best practices. Um, we also discourage it uh, in our available water department guidance for low water use landscapes. And we did not find any uh, peer reviewed research uh, per the request of the subcommittee on impacts to the artificial turf lead to the soil microbiome. That was a question. Um, but I do wanna note, as I uh, spoke to earlier, it's not allowed in the cash grass rebate. Uh, we also on our website have a um, FAQ that says why artificial turf is not rebated. Um, it's provided as an info sheet on the city websites. So with that, I'm gonna hand over this section to Scott. Uh, he can carry it over for this section about city on parks. Sorry. That's fair. Yeah, thank you. I have a question about your presentation. Um, has the city considered you doing a cash for turf program? And if so, would that get in the way of like any um, 
Are there are there funding sources that would allow for that? So typically, um, it, in terms of the water department's approach, we're looking for opportunities to reduce water use because that benefits all rate payers. So uh, typically, we try to get folks to convert from a thirsty lawn to low water use plants. So if it was an artificial turf installation, the assumption that it's very low water use, converting it over, it wouldn't pencil out because the way the program is structured is such that um, the incentives that we give to customers are uh, cost effective from the standpoint of not having to purchase more water. So that's what drives right. uh, that incentive. I mean, the flip side of that though is that um, contaminating water sources or ground to ground and ends up being a cost, an indirect cost in that way. And this is a great opportunity for us to think more broadly than just this one stream and think like, what, what is our goal overall? But I, I do understand the explanation that, but I, I'd encourage y'all to consider the, the broader goal. Okay. Yeah, I, I think we could definitely look into that. It's, it's just a matter of what's consistent with the law around utilizing rate periods. Right, that's costs. what I was asking. Is there a, a barrier there? Is there a barrier there? Um, Yes, because it has to be, if you're using ratepayer funds, it has to be something that is a measurable benefit to all ratepayer classes. In this instance, keeping their bills low um, would be that nexus. Um, so, yes, we could. Um, I, Sounds like it's something to think about. Yeah, it is something okay. to think about, and I, and I will, I will I'll chew on it. Appreciate it. Thank yes. you. Okay. Yes, why do you want to? Drive. Uh, sure. Yeah, thanks. Um, my name is Scott Wilkinson, Parks Planner with the Parks Division. Uh, happy to be here. Council Member uh, Fleming, Council Member uh, Rogers, members of the public, thank you for coming. Um, as Peter mentioned, I'm going to go over uh, some um, aspects related to city owned parks and specifically uh, recreation uh, facilities that, that use our, our artificial turf, namely athletic fields. Um, and uh, similarly, there were a host of, uh, a group of questions that we're uh, seeking to cover here. Um, one, are there current grant uh, fund funds being used to uh, build uh, uh, facilities uh, at our parks using artificial turf um, to the cost of artificial turf versus natural turf, both in terms of the installation and the maintenance of those facilities? Um, some information around the needs and are those needs of the community being met uh, currently? Um, and are they uh, able to be met with uh, natural turf fields alone versus uh, a strategy that would combine both artificial turf and natural? Um, thirdly, can we partner with schools to offset some of that need? And lastly, some um, information regarding uh, public comments that we've received kind of over the, the recent uh, time period uh, related to artificial turf and parks. So driving. Regarding a, a couple of uh, current grant funded projects that we have in, in various uh, design phases, um, a place to play, which many of you know is our sports park uh, in the city. Um, we have received a grant, $1 million through the uh, Ag and Open Space di District's matching grant program there to uh, build additional fields that are part of the approved master plan there via a second phase, which will include uh, up to uh, two multi-use fields and uh, additional amenities that will support those two new fields um, on the uh, south side of the park there. Uh, additionally, we have a significant renovation project at Martin Luther King Jr. Neighborhood Park. Um, it will include a master plan update and a, uh, uh, an upgrade to the, to the overall site, but also the soccer field the facility there. Um, both uh, projects are uh, uh, considering the use of artificial turf for those locations, or in the case of a place to play, new fields that we're building there. Uh, a little bit on, uh, in terms of cost comparison, you can see the uh, cost of installation um, is, uh, is, is higher um, for, for natural grass typically. Um, uh, actually, uh, those two numbers are swapped, I'm realizing at the moment. Um, artificial turf is the higher number 
you can see the square foot number is actually correct, but the, the total field, which is based on sort of full size um, soccer field, um, is should be one million for the natural grass side, and then uh, just over a million and a half or six for natural grass. And this is based on kind of industry standard research that we've done. Annual maintenance cost uh, is in the right alignment. Uh, it is uh, lower on the artificial side significantly, as you can see there, um, as when you compare it to the natural grass uh, field. In terms of life expectancy, um, you know, there, there you can you can read a lot of different numbers that are attributed in terms of how long artificial turf will last. Um, for a while, it seemed like eight to ten years was kind of the standard. Um, now we're seeing ten to fifteen years as as fields have been in place for a, a longer period of time. But there are constantly, uh, you know, uh, new advances. Peter mentioned the infill material that um, contributes to how long these fields uh, hold up. Do in fact hold up over time. Um, with natural grass, a lot of it depend does depend on the quality of the initial installation and whether appropriate drainage was provided and everything. My, my apologies. <laughs> and I and I should explain for the public. Like, my wife got stuck at the hospital and we would have had to cancel if we didn't have two members here. So Ellis says hello, and I'm sorry. <laughs> it's about parks. You should yeah. I've been actually holding for a okay. minute. That's okay. Okay. Yeah. Let me know when you want me to jump back in. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> okay. So again, uh, life expectancy can depend in, 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 in regards to the natural turf systems on, on the quality of the installation and level level of play, obviously, and, um, and, and maintenance, uh, which varies uh, greatly from, uh, say, our parks uh, department to, uh, you know, the field crew at Oracle Park or, or, or something. You know, there's, a, there's just a lot of different levels uh, in that continuum of, of, uh, of maintenance that you can imagine. Um, the real uh, uh, influential piece of this uh, to consider is the capacity for, for play itself. You know, um, the, the, the artificial turf uh, can all, all nearly double the playable hours when you compare it to natural turf. And mostly that has to do with um, accounting for seasonal closures for rehabbing and fields are, are uh, inundated with water and unplayable during up to four to six months out of the year sometimes. Um, so as I mentioned, artificial turf turf, you know, it costs more initially. Uh, the savings over time is significant. Um, however, um, you know, and in this, in this scenario, in terms of the, the cost savings over the years in order to recover that initial installation delta it would be about 16 years um, but again with the playability and the capacity increase um, that we would have uh, or that one has with uh, artificial turf uh, you know that could really cut down the recovery time and add a lot of value to to the feet on a sort of a per field basis a little bit on the artificial turf maintenance requirements, mostly having to do with um, you know, cleaning and grooming type operations. Um, you do see the use of irrigation to um, not only help with the cleaning, but also uh, cooling the fields um, uh, during the hotter months. Um, so that is something that uh, is often built into a project, into a turf, uh, artificial turf project. Um, you can see sort of some of the other weekly, monthly uh, uh, maintenance uh, operations that involve a lot of replenishing of that infill. And yes, maybe some weed control also for the hardiest weeds that could make it up through the carpet there. Um, but we do see that happening and, and that is something that, you know, uh, would need to be attended to as well. But um, moving on to some of the Natural turf maintenance requirements, as you can see, I'm not going to read through all of these, but quite a bit more involved in terms of the inputs, um, both uh, on the water side um, and fertilization side inputs, but also main, uh, manpower and um, the labor required to, uh, to get in there and, and take care of fields. Again, this kind of represents a um, 
an upper end of where the maintenance uh, uh, maintenance regime based on uh, what we have available. Um, it often falls a little bit short. Um, and when you couple the uh, intensity of play that our fields currently get, um, it, it really has an impact and results in needing to really take uh, some of those rehab breaks um, so that fields can be repaired and bounce back. Can we meet the needs of our community with natural turf fields alone? Um, the demand for athletic fields does exceed the supply in the city of Santa Rosa, um, regardless of artificial or natural, um, to the point where many leagues actually use uh, fields in other communities um, or schools. Um, seasons for sports have grown longer and, and many are now year round. Um, and all, all other fields are, are really an amenity that our sports community has been asking for for, for some time now. Um, we do hear from the public that um, the ideal situation would be a mix of natural and artificial um, fields. And we do envision a strategy where we would in fact renovate many of our natural fields with natural. Um, but the reality is, um, you know, in terms of building new fields, uh, we would need to acquire more land, which is expensive um, and, and harder and harder to find parcels that are really able to accommodate fields in, in the city, especially as we grow. Um, so expanding the capacity for play on our existing fields uh, becomes, a, a, with, with artificial turf, does become a compelling part of the strategy to help meet the overall community's uh, needs. Um, can we partner with schools to use their fields? Um, yes and, and no, and we have um, in the past and we continue to do so, but limited avail availability is also limited with the schools. Um, agreements need to be managed annually and, 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 and be entered into. Um, safety is a concern with schools and many schools are becoming less willing to open up their campuses at night and during the weekends. Um, and Schools also uh, struggle to maintain their own fields. So lastly, um, just a few comments uh, relative, uh, some takeaways relative to some public comments that we've heard recently. Um, these are a couple of points from uh, Santa Rosa specific measure M outreach um, that we, we did a couple, a few years back. Um, more athletic fields are needed throughout the city. Uh, these are open from the, an open-ended survey that we conducted. Artificial all-weather turf is important to accommodate uh, for uh, athletic fields. Soccer, the soccer community was well represented and advocated for the need, but also baseball and so so softball communities participated. Um, just a couple of additional questions and things to highlight uh, highlighted in blue on these particular survey questions. How many more athletic fields and sports courts does Santa Rosa need? 38% um, chose five to 10, 20% chose 11 to 20. Uh, what kind of surfacing should new athletic fields be made of? 34% uh, chose all weather or artificial turf um, and 49% chose uh, both types of surfacing uh, are important to have. Um, lastly, would you prefer the city spend money to convert current fields to all weather? lit fields or to build new weather, new all weather lit fields. See the results are in 30% convert current fields to all weather and lit or doing both is beneficial, which kind of gets back to the strategy, you know, a mix of, of uh, a mixed strategy being uh, important. So with that, um, I will close and take any questions that anyone has. You can do questions at the end. I think I just have one small section here. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So um, there were questions from the subcommittee about what other jurisdictions are doing at this time. Obviously a lot has changed uh, with that recent legislation last year that allowed for more uh, rigorous or uh, broad uh, enforcement of ordinances and bans in jurisdictions uh, that began this year. So uh, many different jurisdictions are grappling with it, similar to what's going on here today. So how to move forward. Um, 
just this last fall, the city of San Marino uh, did institute a temporary moratorium uh, uh, through a year, because that's what they were allowed to institute is uh, essentially one year. And that was to allow them time to do a study and do better, better understand the implications of that. Uh, the city of Millbrae uh, perhaps has been looking at this longer than any other jurisdiction. Um, the A Institute of 2021 uh, temporary moratorium, uh, which ultimately became permanent uh, just this year. Uh, I think within the, maybe just the last couple of months here. Um, and it really says the use and installation of synthetic grass and artificial turf landscaping material is prohibited. It's broad blanket prohibition. Uh, they're, they're driven by uh, the fact that they are aiming to limit stormwater runoff, uh, given that the majority of the city is on a hillside. Um, and uh, existing installs, uh, they uh, stipulated that they must allow rainwater permeability and be well maintained. So they went as far as to regulate existing installs as well. Uh, also noting that when an existing install is damaged, it must be removed. Santa Clara County in the last few months uh, proceeded as well with a study for a potential ban on artificial turf on county owned property. And then recently, um, the Committee of the City of Los Angeles' Council approved a feasibility study to look into the health effects specifically uh, of artificial turf and the feasibility of a potential ban. So um, many jurisdictions are um, at least evaluating uh, artificial turf bans, um, and obviously they are armed with uh, new ability to do so uh, given the new legislation. So um, with that, uh, I'm going to pre preview a few slides uh, to get some direction and next steps and open up some questions. So um, really, so this, we'll start with just a staff recommendation. Uh, based upon discussions amongst different departments, uh, the direction is to recommend that council consider a ban on artificial turf installations in Santa Rosa. Staff recommend the following, uh, that it would apply to artificial turf installations as you know, effective date after um, the adoption by council and not be retroactive. Um, exempt sports fields uh, would also recommend uh, exempting installations that currently have either grant funding secured already or are currently in the process of applying for grant funding. Um, and then again, to the presentation portion from Jimmy, uh, code enforcement would be reactive to, co to complaints from the community. Uh, and then also we would uh, need to be proactive about providing information to the public uh, on the outreach uh, and outreach to learn about a potential ban as well. Uh, if the direction is to consider um, not uh, going with the uh, a turf ban, um, the uh, staff would recommend that you proceed with an education component um, we would continue to not rebate artificial installations, essentially looking at other options as well. Um, and then continue to promote the existing Russian River friendly landscaping guidelines, and then provide broad education information about all the concerns around artificial turf. So, and then just in context of what we are hoping to accomplish today, um, based on the direction provided by this subcommittee, uh, staff will bring a study session to a future city council meeting uh, for further directions. Uh, with that, happy to take any questions. I also have people we can call upon in the audience from other departments as well. So, Councilmember Fleming, any questions? No, I'm interested to hear uh, from the public. Yeah. Thank you. And I just want to thank you. I know when we talked about this a year ago, we did have a laundry list of questions and comments. And I know there was a lot of, I think it's probably our best attended climate action subcommittee meeting we've ever had with people who are interested. I think you did a really thorough presentation. Uh, and I, I'll go to the public comment first before we give our, our thoughts and direction, but just want to kind of tip my hat to the to well, everybody who worked on it. So start with public comment. Go ahead, Beth. I'm so glad to see this come up because um, I have, neighbors who now are in artificial turf. And um, I, as I said, I worked at the University of California, San Francisco. You can look at the work of Dr. Tracy Woodruff, who studied forever chemicals and looks at, you know, that there's in 
fetal tissue, the stuff, and uh, passing on to the next generation, next generation. Uh, we do know that there's a very strong causal, if not, well, it's probably as perfect to say association with uh, metabolic and hormonal conditions, childhood obesity and our own obesity related to these chemicals. Your point in, at, in surveying people, I think, is sort of faulty because if you question should be, would you want artificial turf if you knew that this was causing it? So if you're asking people about convenience and about like playing time and all that, and they knew that every time they were on there, it was like you know causing cancer to their children or themselves, that might change the answers. And so I do think playing time though is a counter because we want people to be athletic and want to be out. But I don't want to live next to somebody who's off gassing 24 seven and leaching into my groundwater. That is completely different than having my kid play for an hour or two on a soccer field sporadically. But me living next to people who have, they're off gassing and leaching every single day. I can't hold my breath that long. You know, I mean, and people need to be educated about this stuff. That's a big part of it. I mean, pregnant women used to smoke <laughs> and tell people were like, hey, you know what? So I, you know, a lot of this plastic, plastic bags, we're just inundated with plastics and we're not going to get rid of it. It's just ubiquitous. But we shouldn't be just laying petroleum down and pretending it's grass. It, it's tires, you know? I mean, we're, <laughs> we're landscaping with tires to save water. I mean, does that make sense <clears throat> to people? So, um, I'm very happy to see that this is being brought up and it's been brought up for years. There was a nurse practitioner in San Diego who brought up this issue years ago. And uh, so, you know, we're again, late, late in addressing, you know, just proliferation <laughs> of toxicities. And um, I would really like to not live next to people who are, have petroleum for a lawn. Okay, anybody else? So, uh, my name is Christophe Macho. I'm with South Park Football Club, and we are looking at MLK. Um, I've heard a lot about this turf situation. You know, I've played soccer my whole life since I was four years old. You know, it's always been a conversation. It's always been a topic since I can remember. Um, and I think it's always going to be, you know, as long as it's around. For us, I mean, the community at South Park, um, the soccer field is so important. Not just to the kids, but I think everyone. Um, you guys know, you guys are from here. South Park used to be a very dangerous uh, location in the city, full of gang activity, full of just, you know, all the wrong stuff going on. And we've been around for two and a half years now. And anyone that's been around and goes to the park can tell you that it's, it's a much safer spot, a much safer place for everyone, kids, families, moms. You know, uh, you guys, anyone, anyone of you guys are invited to go and show up, you know, from Monday to Sunday, you'll see people playing soccer, all ages, kids, you know, it's a grandparents, all type from the morning to nighttime. Um, it's very important for us, you know, to get a, a, a turf facility at the field. One, because, you know, it's year round. Uh, we'd be able to, not, uh, the last two years we've been having to play in the basketball court in the wintertime because of lights. And the field is extremely muddy and it's not playable. It's dangerous, you know, for the kids. Um, I understand all the health situations, you know, and, and I'm all for it. And I look forward to a better future for the kids and for everyone, you know, that's going to be a member of the city. Um, but I also think there's a lot bigger problems when it comes to health. You know, like we've talked about plastic. Plastic is, just, you know, it's everywhere. You know, let's not even talk about the drinks that these kids are drinking nowadays, foods. Everything has, you know, some type of problem nowadays. Uh, so I think, you know, turning to banning the turf for, for the kids it just doesn't make no sense to me because, you know, they're using this turf to play soccer. You know, they're, they're, they're on there. They're doing exercise. And we all know obesity is a big problem for most Americans nowadays. So I think, I don't know, it's very important for us to a turf field there, a year-round facility, you know, and I don't know, we've, the soccer community has always felt like, you know, we've been like the, the kid that's been pushed over because our, our, our soccer fields and the grass soccer fields in this, in this county are horrible. They're horrible. They're not playable for kids. 
you know, you go to West Nine, kids train there every day. And I need to day. wrap up, please, if you could. Yeah, yeah, I will. Um, I just want to say, you know, like it's very important for us to, to have somewhere to play for the kids. That's it. Thank you. Any additional comments? Yes. <clears throat> Hello, my name is Dwayne DeWitt. I'm from Roseland. I live relatively close to Southwest Community Park, which every Sunday has lots of soccer, it has a natural field. We need more soccer fields over there. One of the dilemmas that the city faces is sometime in the future, a savvy attorney is going to point out that if you used artificial turf, you may have contributed to some difficult health situation for somebody who used your turf. Um, right now, you're going through a process of putting in ADA accessible corner curb cuts because some attorneys pushed for that some years ago, even though very few people really needed them. So you have to really look at the situation of, will you be held responsible for somebody's astroturf related EFAS cancer and will you have a defense for that? Personally, I believe that we should improve the existing soccer facilities throughout our city. Place to play has been on the burner, if you will, close to 25 years. And we really haven't put the time and effort in to make those fields as good as the soccer player you just mentioned didn't feel it was good. So, I really hope that we return to the turf situation, natural turf wherever we can, and also let the schools who can put in AstroTurf do it, and they can bear that burden. I don't think that the city can keep up with what they have right now. It hasn't shown that to me in the last 25 years, so. Um, also, get more fields. Mr. Wilkinson pointed out it's hard to get land for sports fields, but you need to do that, especially over in Roseland. But we have very few open spaces left. You should be purchasing them now and then making them available for the soccer uh, community. And I believe I'm on time. You're always yeah. on time, Dwayne. Thank you. Anyone else? All right, I'll bring it back. Council member, do you want to start? Sure thing. Um, would you pull up the previous slide, please? Um, or the one where you were asking for um, your recommendation. Your recommendations. Yes, there's the this is the recommendation if you proceed with direction to pursue a turf plan. Yeah. yeah. And then so, there was a second if if not. Okay. Um, I know this is a difficult issue, but for me it's fairly straightforward. People do need places to, to stay, to play, but, um, you know, poisoning our groundwater and poisoning the people who play on those surfaces is, is not a solution and not one that I'll support. I, I will support adding additional dollars to support uh, natural, uh, natural turf. And I do believe we need more of it. It's really clear. So um, I would, uh, let's see, apply turf installations once about. Um, I suppose going retroactive is really administratively challenging. I would not exempt sports fields. Um, I would not exempt installations that currently have ground, grant funding. I think this is something that we're going to look back on in 20 or 30 years. There, I mean, there's more and more lawsuits coming out to, to members of the public pointing out, and there's more and more chance, rates of cancer, particularly impacting women. And um, I think that we don't want to be paying out the kind of settlements that might be associated with this, um, let alone like, I don't know about you guys, but I like to sleep at night. So um, I'd be happy to pay for more fields, uh, more natural fields, examples. So yeah, no more, no more turf. Um, I think it's fine to have reactive complaints on residential properties um, and provide information on the ban. That's all, that's all good stuff. Did you have more things you'd like to stack on? Um. No, just to, if there's anything that perhaps you've missed or you still have for me questions. Yeah, I mean, perhaps something. For yeah, I, I think that as difficult as it is to work with the school system, I know they're overburdened. 
Um, that said, you know, they come to us for, for public safety and for infrastructure around the schools. I think that there are definitely nexuses between the city and the school districts, in particular the largest school district. I think we should be um, we should be working with them in unison and in an integrative manner to to combine resources around their their turf. If they are struggling to maintain their turf, perhaps that we can have economies of scale on maintenance for turf across the city and not just on city on plan. I mean, if you think about it from a position of a member of public, they're not thinking this belongs to the city or this belongs to the school. I, I know that I drive through the town and I'm like, oh, that's a county island or that's a city or that's a school property or that's Caltrans right away. The public, rightfully so, doesn't know, doesn't care and shouldn't have to worry about it, right? I mean, we should just figure out how to deliver the product and we shouldn't say, well, that's the school thing and this is the city thing. We should say, you know, these are the parks. If you let us use them, public use them, then maybe we can figure out how to, to provide some resources for maintenance. Now, I know at the city we're really short on maintenance, but I do believe that we can figure this out rather than, you know, playing catch up with by poisoning the land. It's It just doesn't make a lot of sense. To me. Yeah, so I'm going to agree with the comments from my colleague. I, I mean, I, I think you all kind of knew where I was at on this, which is why I brought it forward a year ago for the discussion. The one thing that I will say is sort of understanding our council dynamics. I think that the two people who have been the most interested in this topic are the two that are sitting here right now. And so I don't want staff to run off and have to do a whole bunch of work because of our recommendation only to have it come back and be a 5-2 where council's not interested in going this direction. So I'd like for the recommendation from the subcommittee to come forward as articulated by council member Fleming. Uh, but I do think that there needs to be a check-in with the rest of the council, whether it's through a study session or through goal setting that let, allows them to weigh in before the city attorney's office has what it would be a big project for them put on their plate that we didn't account for in our last goal setting. Uh, so I want to keep it moving, but let's make sure that it's not DOA with other council members when we get there. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think I have enough here to start crafting a study session. Just, um, yeah, uh, well, how about I just reiterate? So obviously supportive of proceeding with the recommendation for a ban, um, not pursuing anything retroactive, of course, not exempting sports fields, uh, including those that are uh, in the process of securing or have secured grant funding. Um, reactive enforcement is okay. Um, and also looking to try to find some nexus between the school systems and opportunities there uh, for shared uh, resources around recreation and economies of scale for me. Yeah. Okay. Yep. And let's see if we have four council members who are interested to add it to the city attorney and in your self support plans. Yeah. Um, I would just also add that, you know, I think that would be really helpful in this conversation is um, adding in that there, you know, there's a lot of positive messaging about the benefits of artificial turf and not a lot of uh, negative messaging messaging about like the deadly, the deadly attributes of PFAS. I mean, it sort of gets touched on, but I think that, you know, a member of the public um, mentioned, I think it was Beth who said, you know, if people knew that this is going to give them cancer, it's going to be in their children's fetal tissue, they probably wouldn't say, but I just want to go play soccer. You know, I, I don't think that that's how people feel. I think that's you know, in general, it's not how people. So I think that we need to be really clear with the risks and how dangerous this is when we talk to council members, when we talk to members of the public. All right, thank you. Uh, we'll go now to item 6.2. That's a good question that about, is there, in terms of artificial turf, are, are there, might be, I mean, but, but let's ask him after the okay. meeting. Yeah, I'm just, I would like it just as if, if he I, I could give a little about like what is the different types, sir. Okay, yeah, yeah, for a future discussion. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, this item is mine as well. Um, this will be a, little, a lot more brief. Um, I, one of the items uh, that this uh, subcommittee had asked is for 
occasional updates on the city's uh, electric vehicle infrastructure plan, uh, up, up, uh, excuse me, an update for the electric vehicle infrastructure plan for the city's uh, operational fleet. I do want to note that the council did award a contract uh, for a master plan uh, this year. Um, and really the goals are closely aligned with our climate goals, but also uh, it's an important piece to give us that roadmap to compliance with the advanced clean fleets rule, which is a rule recently um, proliferated by, or excuse me, um, put forward by uh, the Air Resources Board of California, as well as the innovative clean transit regulations, which are specific to our transit fleet. Um, really, it's gonna help us with a strategy for continuity of fleet operations with the requirements around transitioning to zero emission vehicles for large commercial fleets like our city-owned fleet. Um, and it will also establish a priority of integration with city-owned facilities that exist today um, and also accommodate new demand, especially electrical demand uh, for uh, an electrical fleet. Um, we did receive funding from the federal uh, clean, block, uh, clean energy block grant, energy efficiency conservation block grant program. Um, the, there was a block grant amount of $210,000 that was given to the city. Um, we did apply for funding for this particular plan and were awarded that money. Um, the council did approve the undesignated general funds this year in their budget for the remainder of that study as well. So we are, uh, in the thick of go, you know, going through with this study and so I'm just providing some updates on uh, where we're at today. So right now um, we're in the middle of uh, two tasks, uh, that being a fleet electrification market and charging analysis, um, as well as a facility energy and resiliency evaluation. Actually tomorrow uh, we'll be out doing site visits at several facilities um, for this particular piece of the, the plan. Um, so really what we'll be doing is we'll take a look at the operational fleet, that being a uh, lens of areas that aren't accepted that, uh, fire and police, which have specific exemptions as emergency uh, providers. Uh, we're looking at the existing fleet usage and the availability of zero emission vehicles uh, for our light, medium, and heavy duty vehicles. So we'll take a look at the entirety of our fleet and assess the types of charging stations that will allow us to continue to support the transition to these vehicles. And they, of course, have to match the vehicle usage as well. Uh, we'll be taking a look at um, renewable energy applications and facilities, as well as current load considerations and the financial impacts to having to build additional charging. We'll also analyze the suitability for renewables, backup generation, uh, energy storage, of course, in an emergency, you wanna still be able to call upon these vehicles, a critical piece of planning ahead uh, for the transition of this. Um, so we started the fleet analysis, uh, as you can imagine, we have a very diverse fleet uh, for all of our operations, and um, especially in public works and water, especially. Um, the majority right now, of course, are gas and diesel. We have started purchasing all electric vehicles, um, and we have some hybrids as well. Uh, really, the city fleet has a high suitability for transition, especially the way it's laid out. Um, most vehicles can be replaced with commercially available EVs uh, with proper charging infrastructure. There are some exemptions in place for specialized vehicles, utility vehicles uh, with equipment and retrofits. Um, you know, those have sometimes secondary power for them. There are some specific exemptions for those. Uh, of course, we're also looking at EV charging hardware and software. Uh, the team, uh, including the fleet folks and other departments, have looked at charging management systems. These are the systems that will balance. Uh, if all the vehicles say come in at one time, take a look at the behavior of the vehicle and establish a priority. Also can align with things like time of use for pg e rates to get you the best value. Um, and so these are a critical component of really creating a, a fleet charging uh, system. Uh, we also looked at hardware operate options. So that's the actual physical chargers uh, and making sure that they are compatible with the charging management system. Um, those uh, compatibility needs are very specific to value with our existing vehicle telematics, uh, synergy with existing um, utilities and programs, and also meeting the individual needs of uh, sites and their load management. 
did select eight sites for evaluation. Um, those are uh, the MSC campus on Stony Point, Finley Community Center, City Hall, Brown Farm, and Station 4, which are water facilities. Okay, sorry, I, I, there's four water facilities. So our next tasks are taking a look at the GHG analysis and the cost benefits, as well as the capital cost estimates for purchase of vehicle and the infrastructure. Uh, we'll also get a good flavor of what external funding sources are going to come online in the coming years. Uh, we'll look at off-grid charging options too and opportunities, as well as um, some work with planning economic development of private EV charging policy recommendations. Those are um, to be critical when you start to have um, uh, private entities wanting to use the city's right of way for charging. Um, so with that, um, the work is ongoing. It's likely we'll be uh, coming before council with uh, more study sessions and uh, more thorough reports uh, by the beginning of next year, actually. So um, in the timeline, we're about halfway through the project. Take any questions if you have. questions? No, thank you. I have a question. Uh, I totally agree with what you're doing. But my question is, is when you decide on a on an area where you want charging stations or solar panels or whatever, I urge you not to do it at the expense of a green environment. Removing trees to do that is a good example. Because at Santa Rosa Middle School, they removed a 50 year old oak tree. And they did it because they're going to put solar panels in that particular area without being, co being cognizant of the, the false equivalency and all that the natural environment gives us. I've never seen a solar panel, for example, that could give us oxygen or sequester carbon in the soil and hold water in the soil. So that's my question. It's just be cognizant of that in your paper location. Thank you, sir. Any other comments from the public? Yes, although I missed what was just presented, I've been following this for quite some time since the 2007 Roseland Community-Based Transportation Plan. Discussions about, at that time, people looking into electric vehicles for buses. Fully supportive of electric vehicles for buses. What's really important, I think, is that you find a way in which you can do this that doesn't disrupt the current lifestyle for schools and hospitals and other facilities. I saw recently that Santa Rosa High School put up solar panels above their big parking lot. So they're working to do things like that. And I would like to see those types of collaborative efforts happening with your efforts between all the different jurisdictional agencies that might put up solar panels and go towards electric vehicle fleets, things of that nature, but always be cognizant about not destroying any nature along the way. You don't have to cut down trees. Typically, we cut things in different ways. Santa Rosa Junior College, they cut down a lot of trees, put in solar uh, on their back lot over by um, that little shopping center on Mendocino Avenue. It's on big, healthy redwoods. That were I was wide as this area, just so they could make sure and get those solar panels on that side. This didn't plan well. So obviously, you folks know what you're doing. So do all the good stuff. Do it well. Thank you. Thanks, Dwayne. Bring it back then. My only question for you really is how has the bankruptcy for um, the provider that's doing our EV buses. Proterra. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Proterra, thank you. I don't have any much from transit here. And I'd love to ask that question, but I can um, I can get that information back okay. to you. I, I'm if not you following it, to be honest, but I, I well, know that's something that's on the forefront. I appreciate it. I know that there's still a lot of ambiguity around what the restructuring will look like in the bankruptcy and that'll how, how that'll impact, but I haven't gotten an update in a while. So if we if we could. Anything else, Council Member Fleming? No, it's good stuff. Cool. All right. Thank you so much. So our last item on the agenda is future agenda items. It's the uh, upcoming meetings list. As I mentioned, we have trees for October. Let's we'll see if there's any public comment. Yes. There's a thing called a neighborhood. I didn't make that term up. 
Okay, again, in other places, specifically over in London, where they were making sure to try to save trees as they did new urban designs. So I do believe that um, one of the things the city could benefit from is making sure that when new development goes forward, it looks at the bigger picture of how to not just maintain trees, but then put new trees in if they knocked any down. This is a concern over in Roseland because the housing that's being built at various places knocks down old, you know, valley oaks that are heritage, supposedly. They don't replace them quickly. And this is at uh, the junkyard on Dutton Avenue. They took down this really beautiful big oak tree and said, oh, we're going to get those back in there. And that's already almost a decade ago. So it's one of these things where I hope as you do preparations for your tree discussions, you look at how your mitigations are actually um, implemented and monitored. Because that's the key to all this is not just planning, it's the management and the maintenance. Thank you. Thank you, Dwayne. All right, with that, uh, just, we uh, will- I just want to note that yeah. Director Water Director Perk is working with her colleagues in other departments to try to bring that item forward in October. Um, we're trying to get that together. Cool. All right. Thank you. Uh, and thank you, everybody, for tolerating Ellis uh, for his first public meeting. Uh, with that, we're adjourned. All right. All right, buddies. Oh, yes.